Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, saints. Why don't you stand to your feet this morning? Greet one another with the love of Christ that has been embedded in us through Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Psalm 135, praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise him, O you servants of the Lord. You who stand in the house of God, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. And sing praises to his name, for it is pleasant. Hallelujah. Let us glorify that name with, in one accord. With all of our hearts, with all of our souls, with all of our with all of our strength, with all of our might, hallelujah, with everything that we have within us, and just pour it out. Lift your hands in this place. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. We magnify you. We're preparing our hearts for something special today, and it'll come from you, Lord. We ask you that you pour out your blessing in this place, that you pour out an anointing in this place that your Holy Spirit may come Lord and work in our lives that your Holy Spirit may come like a wind Father in Jesus name hallelujah and we welcome you Jesus into this place that he is Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. Hallelujah. He is worthy of all the glory.
can lift your hands this morning and give Him praise and give Him glory in this place. Render our hearts today before your presence, Jesus. We, de we declare that you are mighty. We're humbled to be before you, Jesus. my brother. This is what we will be singing in heaven, my sister. There will be no more crying, no more tears, no more pain. somebody give him glory can somebody give him praise for he is good he is worthy of all of the honor he is worthy of all of the dominion all the power hallelujah for he is alpha and he is omega hallelujah let us continue worshiping that sweet name hallelujah that name that is above all other names hallelujah that name that when demons hear, they tremble and flee and run. Hallelujah. That name that heals and delivers.
Hallelujah. We know that He fights for us. Give him praise with all he got. Hallelujah. For he is worthy. He is great and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. Be welcome into the house of the Lord. Those who are here present, those who are watching online, this is your place. This is your home. Amen. The Lord has something prepared just for you. Before we continue, we have some announcements and prayer needs that we'd like to present before the congregation. On Monday night, we have our women's prayer at 8 p.m. For those women who want to be filled with the presence of God some more, who need, who have a special need, that is a place. Thursday, Thursday nights at 7 p.m., we have prayer and Bible study come to be filled with the Word of God. And a reminder that next Sunday is going to be a united service at 11.30 a.m. And then finally, uh, on September 10th, Sister Bianca Centeno has a baby shower at noon in the dining hall, and all are invited. Amen. As we move on to the prayers and petitions, uh, we continue to pray for those who need healing from illness, from disease, and declaring and lifting them before the name of Jesus. And in, uh, Brother Sam Flores, Sister Estefania Modano, Javier Betancourt, and uh, we continue to pray for a, a speedy healing and recovery from uh, Umberto Moreno, uh, Brother Pablo Martinez. Brother Jesus Gutierrez and our pastor and sister Mesa, amen. As we, as we prepare our offerings to bring them before the Lord and the ushers join us, let us lift our hands and go before the presence of God and, and render these prayers before him. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're asking you all these things in Jesus' name, Lord, because we know that only you can do this. We know that only all of this, Lord, it may be impossible for man, Lord, but what is impossible for man is possible for you, Jesus. Sometimes the doctors make it seem hopeless. Sometimes they seem that medication and treatments are the only outlet, God. But you are our escape, hallelujah. You are our rescue. And when we are in need, we can run to you, Jesus. And you free us from captivity. You free us from illness. You free us from disease, Lord. You free us from depression, Lord Jesus. This moment, we're, we're lifting up all these names, God, and presenting them to you, Father. The giver, the healer, the provider, Jesus. Declaring a, a healing in your name, Jesus. Declaring that, that we're, we're already seeing this through victory. 
We're seeing this through the other side of, of the valley of the shadow of, of, of darkness, hallelujah, of the shadow of death. We're seeing this on the other side of that steep mountain that took forever to get over, Lord Jesus. But because of your mercy and grace, Lord, we were able to get through it, Lord. We're declaring all these things, Lord, in your holy and righteous name, Lord, believing for greater things. Because you said these and greater things you shall do, hallelujah. And we know and we believe and trust, Lord. We're lifting up these offerings as well, Father, knowing that you are the provider, Lord, of our every need, Lord. Even long before we, 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 we needed something, Lord, you already knew and you already had the means. You already had the blessings prepared for us, Lord. It was only a matter of time, Jesus. In Jesus' name, Lord, we, we declare all these things, Father, as we come here joyfully to bring an offering in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you come as we worship the name of the Lord? Lord, we ask you to open up the heavens in this place. Open up the heavens over our church. Open up the heavens over our families, Lord. Open up the heavens over our needs, Lord.
Hallelujah. Let's give God the praise, the honor, and glory today. Blessed be the name of the Lord, our King. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful is the presence of the Lord in this place. Right there where you are, before you take your seats. Uh, thank you, praise team, so much. Thank you, Brother Brian, for leading us in worship this morning. I want to direct your attention to Jude 1, 3 through 4. If you could get that ready in your Bible or, or get ready to see it up here on the screen. We want to pray for Gustino Angeles this morning. Those of you that uh, may not have known, but he was operated uh, this weekend. And we're praying for his recovery in Jesus' name and for the miracle of God to work in him. And you guys, uh, if, you, if, you, if you know the Spanish congregation, he's here all the time. He's here with us. Angeles family has been a part of this congregation for a long time. And kids and grandkids have been here. So we're praying for his miraculous recovery. And God does the work that he intends to in his life, as well as impacts his children and his grandchildren. It's such a blessing today to have Louis Garza with us today. God bless you, Brother Garza. Thank you for being here. I want to pray for him and for his wife, that God would continue to bless them. And if it's the will of God, that he just blesses them right on over here. Amen. In Jesus' name, we're happy to have him here. Thank you so much, all of our musicians. Word of God says in Jude 1, 3 through 4, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for the con this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our Lord and God into sensuality or deny our only master and lord jesus christ as you take your seats if they haven't gone out already all the five loaves two fish kids are dismissed to their classroom in tc2 in jesus name and you can shout amen god is good church you're gonna have to forgive me this morning my 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 voice is a little little rough i'm gonna try not to get too excited this this morning and stick to what God has, but God afflicts us the way he wants to afflict us to get his job done. Amen. In Jude chapter 1, verse 3 through 4, we're reading about uh, Jude was one of the brothers of Jesus, along with James, one of the only two that wrote books in the Bible. And uh, he's writing to a, a group of believers, commonly uh, known or, or commonly a group of Jews. But as he writes, he writes first and foremost, he says, the gospel, the faith that was given, delivered to the saints, depending on what version you have, it says to the holy ones. Amen? I think English Standard Version says saints. I think if you look NIV, it says holy ones. These last few months, couple months, excuse me, we've been talking about holiness. And I have the privilege and the joy to be able to wrap up this theme today. As we get ready for the month of September and for what lies ahead and the next theme that we have in store. But as we wrap up holiness, God placed this in my heart. I'm very appreciative for what Brother Reuben preached last week. You know, we haven't dove a whole lot into holiness standards. Um, preaching it from the pulpit, we have preached a lot about what holiness is. Being close to God, the standard of God making sure our mind and our heart and our, our, our life is founded on the things of God and that what we live and what we do reflects Jesus Christ. And as we preach today, as we speak with you today, I want to hang on Jude's words a little bit because he says he wanted to write about our common salvation. That word common, that word common means regular, almost tainted as it were vulgar as if the salvation and the gospel of jesus christ had been changed in their day it had already gone from jesus to the disciples from the disciples they had established the churches the apostles were uh, uh, evangelizing the world and as the apostles would leave from one church to go to the next bible says that people would come into the church and they would twist and they would change the word of god for their own benefit for their own purpose for their own desire and so he says, I'm eager to write to you about our common salvation. 
Because you see, there's commonality in the doctrine of God. No matter where you go, there's a base, there's a purpose, there's a reason. And as apostolics, we have our doctrinal points that God has given to us. Amen. We believe in Jesus Christ. He is our Lord and our Savior. We believe in one faith, one Lord, one baptism in Jesus' name. We believe in the Holy Spirit and the, the gift of the Holy Spirit. We believe in, 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 in that Jesus died on the cross. We believe in the, the Last Supper and, and remembrance of that, that event and of the body and the blood that Jesus sacrificed for our sins. We believe in Jesus' name. We believe in the latter and the end days. We believe in the rapture. We believe that there will be coming a time of revelation. And all what the gospel is, that Jesus died on the cross, rose again on the third day, and that he is coming back for his church. We believe in that gospel message. And as the time had gone on, that's all right. You don't have to get too excited. I know, I, know, I, I, I told you my voice isn't going to have much inflection today, so you just got to do it for me, okay? But you see, the world has taken this gospel message. This gospel message has been around for 2,000 plus years now. And it's taken the message and it's used it for its own purpose, its own benefit, its own reasoning to do different things for whatever man has desired. But the fact of the matter is the saints of God, the holy ones of God, don't use the gospel for their own benefit. They use the gospel for the benefit and the truth of what God is preaching and what God is teaching. Amen. As we've talked about with holiness, holiness is not something we give to God. It's something that God gives to us, a closeness, a, a, an ability to be close to God. In the same way, the gospel is not something we learn and then we give it out the way we think it ought to be. The gospel is given to us by God. It is etched. It is made. It is done. No one can add to it. No one can take away from it. It is the word of God, and no one ought to use it for their own personal benefit or reason. Amen? The gospel is given for the saints of God to go into the world to deliver the word of God as God delivered it himself in Jesus' name. Amen? The gospel hasn't changed. It hasn't moved. The markers are not moved over time. It stays the same because our God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So the gospel stays the same. And the purpose of the gospel is not for people to feel comfortable or feel good. The purpose of the gospel is to lead unto salvation. Plain and simple. The gospel is not meant for you to feel warm and fuzzy, amen? Jesus said, I'm not coming to unite people. I'm coming to divide house, mother against uh, daughter and son against father. He said, the gospel is going to transform. It's going to change. It's going gonna, it's gonna to alter the course of time and the universe. Everybody's into Marvel nowadays. Everybody's watching Loki and how there's different, different tangents and different, different timelines. Everybody likes the new series. But I want to tell you this, those tangents and those, those different things, that's not reality. Amen? There is one truth, there is one gospel, and there is one way, and that way is Jesus Christ. No one can change that. No one can make their own truth out of that. No one can make their own tangent out of that. And we've talked about being holy. We've talked about what holiness is. Holiness is the, 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 required, the requirement for you to receive the fullness of the gospel. Amen? That is to say, if you don't obtain or maintain holiness in the presence of God, and you receive the gospel, you're more likely to twist the gospel for your personal benefit because you're not allowing the holiness of God to receive the gospel for you. I'm going to say that again. Bible says that all of the law was made perfect for God's will. There's nothing wrong with it. The word of God, the Bible that you have, there's nothing wrong with that word. There's never anything wrong with that word. If you find something contradictory, you need to seek the scriptures because the word of God does not contradict himself. Jesus himself says, I did not come to abolish the law, but I've come to fulfill it. Amen? That means the gospel was formed and fashioned and made by the hands of God for his purpose, for his reason, and nobody throughout history has been able to change that no no leader has been able to condemn it no country has been able to overrule it no law no philosophy has been able to get rid of it no science has been able to bury it nothing has been able to transform and change the gospel because the gospel is the word of God but people have tried to change it people have tried to use it for their own personal benefit for their own gain amen 
And Jude says this common salvation is that people have taken it for themselves and made it into what they want it to be. He said, so I find it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith. Don't go to that, that slide yet, brother. Go back one. To contend for the faith. That word contend, it means fight. It means fight. Brothers and sisters, the world isn't going to hand us the gospel and say, here, this is for you. Go ahead and take it. The world is fighting to take away from you the things that God has blessed you with, the things that God wants to give to you, the future, the yes and the amen that comes in Jesus Christ. The world is not trying to wrap it up for you and give it to you. It's trying to take it from you. Because the enemy is at work. And he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And so Jude says, contend for the faith. That means fight for it. Don't give it up. Don't let it go. Because it was once and for all. That means once. It didn't change. It, hasn't, it doesn't get delivered to Brother Brian differently than it does to Brother Ray. It doesn't go to Brother Roger differently than it does to anyone else. Amen? Amen? The gospel arrives to the heart of human, humanity of each and every one of us the same way it did to Peter, the same way it did to Paul on the road to Damascus. God quickens us, makes us alive, and we receive his word. And that receipt of that word has been delivered to the saints of God. And when he quickens us and makes us alive, he sanctifies us by his blood so that we can receive the gospel and the truth and hold on to it. So our holiness, brothers and sisters, is not just for us to be prepared for the presence of God. It's for us to constantly carry and house the gospel of God with us. All right, let me break that down a little bit more. Because sometimes we think that holiness is something we have to do, we have to be, because it's something we need to do to receive salvation. No, the Bible says salvation is, is by the grace of God through faith, amen? Amen. There's no action you do for it. Praise God. When you get baptized, you accept the Lord and Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. You go into those baptismal waters, you're covered by the blood of Jesus. God fills you with his Holy Spirit to complete what he tells Nicodemus. Unless a man be born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Amen? It happens the same way throughout time. It is the gospel. It is the dispensation of grace. So holiness then is what the gloves we put on to hold the gospel. If I could put it that way, amen? In order for you to wield a sword properly, you have to have training, amen? You have to learn, otherwise you could hurt somebody. You could hurt yourself. <laughs> if you wield a sword improperly, you can cut yourself, you can hurt yourself, amen? So you receive training to be able to hold that sword properly and to be able to defend yourself in battle. Holiness is the training you receive to hold the word of God properly. The Bible equates the word of God to a sword, amen? He equates it to a sword. And so as you learn to live for God through holiness, you learn how to hold the word of God properly and how to use it for the defense of the faith, not, not only for the defense of your life. So he says, appealing to you to contend for the fight for it, because what has been delivered to the holy ones, what has been delivered to you, it's important for you to maintain it. Otherwise, you're going to go into battle with something less than a well-founded sword. I, I, like, I like that show, Forged in Fire. I don't know if anybody watches that. Forged in Fire. They put four competitors together. And they have them make a knife in 90 minutes, right? And it's so sad, but it's also so very entertaining when as they test those knives, one of them breaks, bang, right? And as that knife breaks, then they go back. They cut back to the person, that, the, 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 the bladesmith, and, and, they, say, and they, they ask and they talk about it. it was, well, I know. I, I, didn't, I didn't fashion it right. I didn't heat it up enough. It must not have been a unified heat. And when I dipped it into that oil, I should have used something else, or I dipped it in too fast. And they start to talk about what went wrong with the making of that blade. Amen? And a lot of times in life, we want to say, well, something's wrong with God. Something's wrong with the word. Jesus, I quoted the scripture. Lord, 
I pray, I go to church. What's, what's happening? What's wrong? How you hold the sword matters. How you use the gospel matters. And what we have to hold the gospel of Jesus Christ is holiness. Amen? It's the holiness of God. He makes us his saints. He makes us holy for that very purpose. Now, what do I mean by this common thing? Go ahead and go to the next slide now. 17th century historian, Philip Schaff, he was a, a, a Swiss-born American. He was actually born in Swiss, Switzerland. He came to America. He was a, a, a scholar, a historian. He was a believer. He was a believer. And he wrote this. He said, without money and arms, Jesus of Nazareth conquered more millions than Alexander Caesar, Muhammad, and Napoleon. He said, without science and learning, Jesus of Nazareth shed more light on things human and divine than all philosophers and scholars combined. Without the eloquence of schools, he spoke such words of life as were never spoken before or since and produced effects which lie beyond the reach of orator or poet. Without writing a single line, Jesus of Nazareth set more pens in motion and furnish themes for more sermons, works of art, and songs of praise than the whole army of great men of ancient and modern times. Listen, Jesus is the perfection of the gospel. He is the perfection of the gospel. And what he did, men have not been able to replicate ever in humanity and his history. There has never been anyone like Jesus. He was human like you and I. The only difference was he had no sin. And because he had no sin, he was holy. And because he was holy, he could wield the gospel with more power and authority than anyone ever has throughout all, all lifetime. That's what we've been called to do. When we talk about being called to holiness, you don't need money and you don't, need, you don't need heavy machinery, you don't need guns, you don't need uh, weapons to conquer the things in this life that you need to conquer. You just need the gospel. You just need the gospel. And holiness will bring you closer to God to understand what the gospel is teaching to you. And you know the scriptures and the Bible and what they've taught us and what they've trained us and how they went to Jericho and how they shouted with nothing but the gospel. And walls came tumbling down. Oh, those were just Sunday stories. Sunday, Sunday Bible school stories. Brother Johnny, how, how Gideon put his soldiers around the edge of that ravine of the mountaintop. And how they shouted and how they broke those jars on the floor and caused confusion amongst the enemy. By the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. When the people of God decide to be holy and hold on to the gospel that God has given to them, there is nothing that can stop the work of God and the plans of God from coming to fruition. I don't know if you know this. You can look it up later. I didn't want to go through all the proof on this. But most of the science began with Bible believers who wanted to understand God's touch over nature God's creation itself so science began as a way of observing the nature that God created around us not only that many universities throughout Europe were designed and created uh, uh, out, of, out of biblical learning individuals uh, especially going even into the dark ages when it started with monks and and universities and schools and places of learning started in places where the Bible was being taught I'm not saying you have to be, believe in science or I'm not saying you have to go to school to know Jesus because Jesus didn't go to school and Jesus didn't even have a science degree. But because he was close to God and because he was holy and because he understood the gospel, he knew more about the human condition than science could ever explain. He knew more than all the philosophers in the world could ever share. Why? Because the gospel is truth. 
And because when the holy ones of God believe in the gospel and seek God for answers and truth, the gospel reveals the wonder-working power of God and the intricacies of the human heart and the human spirit and how we must relate to God and this world. Hallelujah. The next one, I don't even have to go very far. Paul says it himself, I don't speak with eloquent words. I don't, I don't speak with convincing words. Brother Johnny is not an English major. Many of you know that. I have a science background. I can barely put a paper together and get an A on the paper. Matter of fact, most of my papers in college and high school were B's and C's. It was the one area I really struggled with. Why did God make me a preacher? Because it's not about fancy words. It's not about fancy words. It's about truth. It's about the gospel. It's about getting close to your God and knowing what your God is whispering in the middle of the night to you. What he's sharing with you. And I find this last point fascinating. It just stirred my spirit. The fact that Jesus never really did write anything down. You know, the kings in the Old Testament, they would get scribes and they would write down the history and what they did and what they went through. When Jesus went before the Sanhedrin, when Jesus went the night that they were going to crucify him or they were, they were uh, <clears throat> judging him, excuse me, he went before them and they slapped him and he says, what have I said wrong? I've spoken publicly before all of you. <laughs> there were no iPhones to record Jesus talking. There were no scribes being called to the side, writing things down. As a matter of fact, the Pharisees would have rather that didn't happen at all, that none of his words would be remembered. He didn't have a ledger. His disciples weren't writing things down. As a matter of fact, most of the disciples and their words that, that Jesus spoke were written in, 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 coming in the end of that generation as the Gospels were put together in 70 AD and, and around that time. Yet more of what Jesus said has impacted this world since he's been gone and been memorized and been taught and been preached. Because the word of God does not stop with the last breath of a human being. But it lives for eternity because it's truth. And when you draw close to God, you can believe the truth of God that is written in these scriptures, that is written in these words, because that's what holiness does. It draws us closer. And so the message this morning is don't mess with the message. Don't mess with the message. If you think there's something wrong that's going on in your life and you can't put it together in the Bible, don't change your walk with God because you don't understand it, but rather draw close to God, learn his word, and change yourself. Allow God to change you. Because holiness has standards. Holiness transforms the one that it's occupying. Amen? Nobody moves into their house and doesn't change a thing. Everybody moves in and wants to add their touch. Wants to put the furniture just the way they want it. Wants to paint and color the walls and put the pictures up that they want. Just the way they want it. It's in our nature that when we move in, we want to change, adapt, and even change so often. We have that character because that is how the spiritual world works. Amen? When a spirit enters into a body, it changes that body. When demons entered into men and women in the Old Testament, those men and women could not control their actions, their walk, their way of life. But it took hold of them and it controlled them and it changed their outward appearance to, be, to reflect the chaos and the destruction that occupied them within. And every time Jesus, the Holy Spirit, would come into a human being, and occupy, that that spirit would occupy the seat, the heart, the altar of a man. That person would be transformed. That person would be changed. 
in order for the gospel to take its full effect on us, we have to allow the Lord to move into us. We have to allow him to arrange our life. We have to allow him to set things the way he wants them to be set. Holiness is the process as you draw closer to God of us looking more like God and less like what we used to look like. Amen. You've heard the definitions, different, separate, amen? Holy, we're going to get to a page that has exactly that. If you want to jump there, you can. But you can't mess with the word of God as it comes into us, as it transforms us, as it changes us. And every now and then, we just, we just want to put down a blockade and we're gonna say, wait, wait, God, not there yet. I'm not ready for that yet. Wait, God, don't, don't touch that area. I'm not ready to get let go of that yet. Hold on, God, I, I want to keep doing this the way I do it because I'm comfortable that way. Amen? But holiness is not comfort. If I could share anything with you, holiness is being uncomfortable. Holiness is not feeling comfortable when you're walking through this world. Holiness is when you hear people cuss and slander. You cringe in your heart because you know how evil it is. Holiness does not let you get comfortable in your situation because you know the trouble and the trial that is at, at bay because you know what is coming along the way. When I was baptized in Jesus' name, I no longer felt comfortable going to certain places, doing certain things, going with family to places that I used to go all along. And I'll tell you even this, as time has gone on, there's things that I've done in the last 10, 20 years being a baptized saint that even more and more I feel less comfortable doing. Because God continues to transform us, continues to mold us, continues to call us closer to his presence. You know, Isaiah, when he became in the, after being a prophet of God, and Isaiah comes in the presence of the Lord, he says, Woe is me, for I am an unclean man with unclean lips. Holiness is uncomfortable. Being in the presence of God is uncomfortable. If you know what I'm saying, say amen. Because when you're in the presence of God, you're naked before him. He can see through you. He can understand every emotion, every thought, every feeling. And when you try and give him that, that answer, that excuse, it doesn't work with God. It's uncomfortable, right? I've had to accept there's juniors at camp that are uncomfortable with Brother Johnny because he doesn't compromise at camp, right? They would rather be with somebody who's going to let them get away with the things that they're doing. But when they come to camp and they can no longer get away with those things, they're uncomfortable. And we don't talk to them a whole lot and they don't tell us they're uncomfortable, but it's demonstrated by the way they interact with God at the altar, because they can't move because they're uncomfortable. They can't jump and they can't rejoice because they're uncomfortable. And you can see the same thing throughout all the saints in the house of God. When there's an altar call, the ones who are comfortable in the presence of God because they are used to holiness, they run to the altar of God. I need you. I need to be back in that place. I know it's not great because I've what the things that I've done, but I need it. And there are others who have been lied to by the enemy and that have tried to change the message of God. And so they cannot get comfortable in the presence of God and they remain comfortable where they are. Revelations 22, 18 says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And in Luke 21, 33 and 34, it says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life. And that day may come upon you suddenly like a trap. You see, we might be in church and we might know what the word says, but when we're weighted down with the dissipation and the drunkenness of life, when we're more concerned about how we're going to make the mortgage payment than having a Bible study in our house, we're weighed down with the dissipation of life. When we're more worried about how nice our car looks uh, compared to how our family comes to church, we're more, we place the cares of this life above the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's not holiness, church. That's not holiness. Holiness is being ready for the day of the Lord. 
Holiness is being ready and watching every day and making sure our heart is free from the junk and the filth that this world tries to throw upon us because we know that everything's going to pass, that nothing's going to remain the same, but that the word of God will stay the same no matter what. And it's the one place we can be where we can stand with two feet and know that whatever storm comes its way, we will stand firm on our rock, which is Jesus Christ. So holiness doesn't let us move to the left or to the right. Holiness keeps us connected to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Holiness keeps us connected so that we understand and that we know what God wants for us. I'm going to say that again. Holiness keeps us connected to the gospel so we know what God wants for us. Not so that we can make decisions on our own without the conscience of God, without the weight of God upon us. And those of you that have heard the word of God in your life and have had, that, had to make that tough decision, you know sometimes that's not easy. It's not always easy in the presence of God. Holiness is not always easy. It comes with a price. It comes with a price. But I'm reminded when Jesus told the disciples, he said the rich... It's very hard for them to get to heaven. They've had their pleasures now. But the poor, they get rewarded with the things of heaven because they've suffered so much now. You want to know why you suffer when you're holy? Why it's uncomfortable when you're holy? Because God's trying to keep you away from the things that are going to keep you out of his kingdom. And because he needs you to recognize that the riches of this world are not going to get you anywhere with any purpose or any plan. Listen to Jesus' words. Lest your hearts be weighed down. You know people that have a lot of money. We hear the tragic stories on the news all the time. Famous singers, celebrities committing suicide overdosing, dying. Why? Some of them even believe in Jesus. Why? Because their heart is weighed down. It's weighed down, amen? If you're burdened today, if you're burdened in your heart, if you feel weighed down, if you feel depressed, get into the gospel. Let God bring you closer. Let him, let him take that off of you. How does he do it? Through holiness. But I don't, I'm not ready to change with a Johnny. Then continue in your situation. I've seen pastor give people beautiful advice for them only to walk out those doors and never come back and end up worse than they were before because they don't want to hear the gospel. They don't want to listen to the gospel, the plan that Jesus has for each and every one of us. We think we're so individual. We think we're so special. We think we're so different. Yet we're all created from the same creator. Yet we're all made in his likeness. Yet we're all given one gospel to be saved by. You tell me how individual we are. Holiness doesn't change from generation to generation. It doesn't change from church to church. Holiness is the same because it's his. It's his holiness and his alone. I touched on this briefly in one of my previous messages in holiness. The word saint comes from the Greek word hagios. Hagios. Properly, it means simply different. Saints. I know, I know back in the day, Brother Aguilar you used to call people santo, right? In church, you'd gather with each other. You don't hear that a whole lot anymore. I have a dear friend down in La Mesa Church. He texts me santo. Feels good, but it also reminds me who I am. It also reminds me of what I'm supposed to be. We're saints of the Most High God. We're sacred, we're holy, we're set apart by or for God. Listen to this. To the believer, it means we're likeness of nature with the Lord. When you're a saint of God, it's not just a title. It's not a halo that goes over your head. You're not canonized by some authority. 
when you're called of God, when you're made holy, when you're separated by his, him, the, the qualification of that separation is to be in likeness of nature with the Lord. He called Israel out of Egypt. Why? Because I don't want you to be like the nations of the world. I want you to be like the nation that I have founded and formed. I want you to have the blueprints that I give Moses from heaven so that everything you do on earth reflects your heavenly dwelling place. When he calls us to this gospel, he has an intention of making us in like nature with him. In like nature with him. That's why Paul says, let this mind that was in Christ also be in you. Amen. Have the nature of Jesus Christ. We have a blessing, a benefit. Amen. We don't just have to point to Moses and say, well, that was the best we got. We don't have to point to David and say, well, that was a man after God's own heart. We have Jesus, the perfect son of God, as an implementation, as a mechanism, as a design, as an experience that we can form and fashion ourselves after. To be like the Lord. To be like God. You're saints. You're made holy so that you could be like God. Why do we need to be like Jesus? If Jesus carried the gospel and he was given the ministry of reconciliation for which God was in Christ reconciling the world back unto him, the Bible says. And we're supposed to do the same thing. We've been given that ministry of reconciliation. Then we have to have a command of the gospel. We have to have an understanding of the gospel, of the word of God. And the way we do that appropriately is through holiness. Every time Brother Johnny preaches, I have to go to God. I have to say, God, is this right? Is this what you want me to preach? This isn't my understanding. This isn't my interpretation. God, is this from you? I can't just come up here and just bladder what I think is my opinion. God forbid that I ever preach an opinion. We're called to preach the word because the word is the truth. And the word is what God breathes into us so that we can become more like him. It's not just to feel good. It's not just to receive your blessing and then walk out those doors. It's a transformation. It's a change. Holiness doesn't just come and float by us and give us that, ooh, feels good feeling. Holiness sticks. Holiness convinces. Holiness, as Brother Reuben was saying, takes all that power and that, that, that everything that you think what you are, and it puts it into control of the spirit. It brings meekness. It brings patience. It brings love and kindness. Why? So that we can be like our Lord. Musicians, come on up. My voice is about done. Go ahead and stand to your feet, if you wouldn't mind. So I'm going to come back to Jude's words here. When he says, contend for the faith. Fight for the faith. Now the Bible says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against darkness. How do you fight darkness? It's not hard. You fight it with light. Jesus says, You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. What makes us light? What makes us salt? It's holiness. It's holiness. We look like God. Jesus is the light of all mankind. We have to fight to remain that light, church. Because Jesus says, if the salt loses its saltiness, what good is it for? Except to be thrown to the ground and be trampled on. If it feels like we're in a fight because our churches don't feel like they have as many numbers as they used to, we're in a fight. People don't want to be holy anymore. 
They want Jesus for what they want Jesus for. They want a common gospel. Does that make sense? Have I explained that enough? They want a common gospel. They want a gospel they can take and they can use for their own personal benefit, their own personal gain, and say, yeah, I know Jesus and one day I'll be in heaven, but I'll keep doing what I want to do here. They want a common gospel. They want a gospel that says it doesn't matter what you believe in. If you believe in Jesus, great, but if you believe in anything else, it all goes to the same God. They want a common gospel. The sad thing is Christianity is tending towards a common gospel. We have to fight for this faith. We can't let it go. We can't put it down. You can't just say, God, I don't want to be holy anymore. You can't just say, God, I'm tired of this. Listen, Elijah was tired, but he still made him cake. And he still gave him the strength he needed. There will come a time when we will live this life. We will leave this life and we will go home. And all of our troubles and all of our burdens will be swayed away. And you won't hurt anymore and you won't cry anymore and you won't fear anymore. But until that time comes, fight for the gospel. How do you fight against darkness? You remain in the light. You stay holy. You draw close to God. You get close to Him every moment you have an opportunity to. You don't let the, the, the weight of this world, the problems, the issues, you don't let them carry you away. But Brother Johnny, I lost my mom. I lost my dad. I feel the same things everybody else feels. Yes, but you have the gospel. But you have a hope. You have a light. Why? Because God has separated you. Because God has made, called you His saint. Because God has made you holy. You see, God felt the same things we feel. When they slapped him on the face, when they pulled his beard out, when they put the nails in his hands, when they put the cross, the, 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 the crown of thorns on his head, every sorrow, every sympathy, every agony you've ever felt, he felt it so that he could become our God and he could become our high priest. Why? So he can make us holy. So in the middle of the dilemma, in the middle of the problem, in the middle of the trial, so he can sweep on in and he can say, I know what you're feeling. Take this. Take this. What is it, Lord? It's my gospel. It's the hope for humanity. It's the answer for every problem, for every delusion, for every weighted heart. It's my gospel. It's what I did for you. So that when you're down and out, you might remember it's not by your strength that you're making it to heaven. It's by mine. I overcame the grave and the cross. In your weakness, I'm made strong. It's so that when you're sad, you remember it's not your sorrow you have to live by. It's my joy that you've got to live by. It's my gospel. It's the truth. And the world is going to spend its days and life is going to chip away trying to get you to give up. We've been to some funerals recently. How beautiful it is when we can quote those words. I have fought the good fight. I have ran the race. My body might be ready to go in the grave, but there's still a light shining over me. A life that cannot be taken away. A hope of a resurrection one day. I want to invite you to this altar today to fight. Your fight today may consist of a specific issue that's threatening your faith. It might consist of an issue threatening your family. It might be a physical need. But when you're up here today, I want to invite you just to receive his gospel. Give praises to God. 
Can you give thanks to God for this message? Hallelujah. For this message, this reminder that we need every single day in our walk with God. Hallelujah. Because we won't see God without holiness, says the scripture. It is a requirement before we get to the presence of God. If we want to see Him one day with our own eyes, not, not praying, not, not speaking to Him in, in a spiritual sense, but with all of God's fullness, see Him for who He is. Hallelujah. We need that holiness. We need to remember that it is worth saying no, that it is worth going the extra mile for our King. Hallelujah. So that one day we all may be in heaven. Hallelujah. We all may be worshiping God for eternity. Hallelujah. And before we dismiss, there's one more reminder. The women are selling, the women's auxiliary is selling uh, orders, sopes, at the end of the service. If you want to submit an order right after, you're more than welcome to. Amen. Let us lift our hands in Jesus' name. Lord, we come before you one more time and we thank you, Father, for everything that you've done in this service, Lord, for allowing us to open up our mouths and lips and lift up your name, Lord, high as the heavens, God. Thank you for the healing that you are providing, Lord, whether it be spiritual or emotional or physical, God, that you will do it, Lord, because you've done it before, Father. In the past, and you will do it again because you don't change, Lord. I may change, our circumstances may change, this world, the times may change, but you remain the same, Lord. You remain powerful, you remain uh, omnipotent, you remain omniscient, Lord, and you will never change, God. Let us seek to be holy, for you are holy. Let us seek to be like you, God each and every day of our lives, Lord, that the light that you shed on us may reflect on others, Lord, and others may see how amazing, how glorious, how beautiful you are, Jesus. Dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence, Lord, as we make our way through the week to our schools and our workplaces. In Jesus' name, we all pray and say, amen. God bless you.